central to the notion of plate tectonics is that the plates themselves move with relatively little internal deformation. All the action happens on the boundaries. So plate interiors are strong. But what do we mean by this? How strong are they? And does this strength vary? In pondering these questions, we'll look at earthquakes and consider the rheology of rocks to construct profiles of strength variations with depth and we'll use these to address some tectonic questions. So let's look at earthquakes. And one of the most striking things about maps of earthquake distributions like this is the difference between continents and oceans. Plate boundaries in oceans are narrow, but you could hardly say that about the continents. There's a broad swathe of earthquake deformation across from Tibet all the way across through to the Alps. It's really hard to put a plate boundary through there. So this difference between continents and oceans, they deform differently. Does this imply that they have a different rheology? But actually there's variation within the continents themselves. So let's zoom in and consider the distribution of earthquakes with depth in the crust. So here's a compilation of earthquakes for the Zagros area, that shaded area on the map. And you can see that there's a concentration of earthquakes in the top 20 kilometers and no earthquakes in the lower crust. Well, let's contrast that with this region of northern India, where earthquakes occur throughout the crust. And if we throw in some other compilations, we can see how much variation there is across the entire map. So what do these earthquake distributions mean? Well, let's think about this in terms of some rock deformation. Earthquakes occur on faults, and faulting then appears to be restricted for the Zagros data set to the upper crust. Frictional sliding on faults is described as a brittle process. And we can describe the lower crust as being aseismic. There are no earthquakes there. But that doesn't mean that there's no deformation. Rather, that it occurs by a different mechanism. An inference might be that it's deforming by creep processes plastic deformation such as we can recognize in exhumed deeper crustal rocks such as this sheared granite. Now plastic deformation is temperature sensitive. As rocks warm up they become weaker and there have been various attempts to quantify this behavior. Here's one of these. So if we take a granite composition of quartz and felspar at a particular strain rate we can calculate how its strength varies with temperature and we can see that it drops away very quickly as the temperature increases. We also know that temperature increases downwards in the crust. And if we know the geothermal gradient, we can take this temperature scale and convert it into a depth scale. So let's do this, assuming a geothermal gradient of 20 degrees per kilometer. Here we are. So now we can see that this catastrophic weakening of the granite is occurring between about 14 and 19 kilometers down. At shallower depths it's strong, at deeper depths it's very weak. So if we change the geothermal gradient, the depth of that critical weakening will change. So for a 40 degree per kilometer geotherm, the critical weakening here is now happening between about 7 and 12 kilometers. Conversely, if we have a cooler geotherm, at 15 degrees per kilometer, the critical weakening is occurring at a deeper depth of between 20 and 30 kilometers. So the geotherm is critical in controlling the strength profile for these granitic rocks. So let's think about this in terms of depth. Let's rotate our diagram round. Here we go. So now we've got depth more conventionally running up and down the screen. So we thought a little bit about the viscous behaviour for temperature sensitive deformation, but what about the shallow crust? Well, as we've seen from the earthquake data, that's deforming by faulting. So the deformation is frictionally controlled. The good news is that we're dealing with shallower depths, so it means it's easier to explore the behaviour of these rocks using deformation experiments. So here we've combined a whole pile of experimental data from an array of rock deformation experiments 
and these results apply to granites, gabbros, peridotites. So this behaviour is insensitive to the composition. There's a quasi-linear relationship between strength and depth, and the slope of this relationship is the coefficient of friction. So these deformation experiments have been calibrated against direct observations from very deep boreholes. And here's an example from the KTB in Germany, the ultra-deep borehole, and those are in situ results going down the borehole. These are also picking out a linear trend on a slightly different gradient. And this range in friction coefficient between 0 0.8 0 0.65 is generally thought to be typical. But there are outliers. Here's an example, which are swelling clays, and these are super slippy. They have a friction coefficient of about 0 0.17, and they can be important for the behavior of some fault zones, for example, but they're probably not appropriate for the behavior on the lithosphere scale. So we'll stick with these higher values. Let's use this one. So we have a model here for frictional sliding with the strength increasing linearly with depth. Now let's add the information from plastic deformation that we've looked at already. Here we go for the 20 degree per kilometer geotherm. And we can put these two behaviors together to establish a strength depth profile. Think about this moving down through the crust. So we start off in the frictional sliding regime and the strength is gradually increasing. But eventually we get to a depth where the rocks creep instead. So the mechanism of deformation changes and as we move down now, we're moving down the temperature dependent curve and the rocks are getting weaker with depth. So this change in the deformation style from faulting in the near surface to creep at depth, well, the transition point is known as the brittle ductile transition. A better name might be the frictional plastic transition if we're going to be strict about it, but everybody calls it the brittle ductile transition, so we'll have to live with that. And it's at this point that we expect the really big earthquakes to be nucleating. In terms of the bulk strength of this crustal profile, well, that's the integrated curve. So the consequence of this is for a layered rheological structure. Brittle fault dominated when it's cool, and that means near surface. But when the rocks warm up sufficiently, they can creep. And in those positions at depth, we have a temperature sensitive behavior and the rocks become weaker with depth. And it depends on the geotherm. So let's plot now the 40 degree per kilometer profile. Let's compare this with the previous one. So here we go for the 40 degree per kilometer geotherm. The brittle ductile transition is significantly shallower. Notice also that the integrated strength of these two profiles is different. The warmer profile is significantly weaker. And we can stick in the cooler geotherm. And again, we see it, the brittle ductile transition is deeper. So. Gentle geotherms, deeper earthquakes, steep geotherms, shallow earthquakes. The geotherm is key. But this analysis has only been concerned with granitic compositions. Plastic deformation depends on composition as well as temperature. And not all the world is made of granite. What about the upper mantle? So let's move this crustal profile to fairly high on our strength depth profile and continue down below the moho. What we've done now is create a three layer model. So we made our crust slightly more complicated rather than suggesting it's all granite, we're saying the upper crust is dominated by quartz rocks, the lower crust is dominated by feldspathic rocks, and the upper mantle, of course, is dominated by olivine. So these are all crystalline, so they all have the same frictional sliding behavior. So we can put that in as a single frictional sliding rule, showing strength simply increasing with depth. But what about the plastic viscous behavior? Well, each of these different compositions will have its own behavior. Let's put them in. Qualitatively through these, for a given temperature, quartz is weaker than feldspar, which in turn is weaker than olivine. And this is represented by the ways in which these curves catastrophically weaken at different depths. Let's just colour that in. There we go. So this is the integrated strength depth curve. 
and for each of these three layers they've got their own transition from frictional sliding to creep processes so each experiences its own brittle ductile transition and consequently we expect a zone of upper crustal earthquakes where the quartz dominated rheology flips over from frictional sliding to creep a lower crustal set of earthquakes where the felspar dominated layer changes its behavior from frictional sliding to creep and then another one in the upper mantle when olivine does its stuff so by allowing the composition to vary we can generate quite complicated strength depth profiles developing geodynamic models that require understanding the relationship between strength and depth therefore would require understanding not only the thermal structure but also the composition often that's, that involves too many unknowns so it's common to simplify the rheology of the lithosphere and quote it as a single parameter the effective elastic thickness to illustrate this this is a map of effective elastic thickness for Africa and part of the Middle East and it shows variations in effective elastic thickness of 120 kilometers to below 20 kilometers so quite a range of effective elastic thickness quite a range in strength therefore for this region it's important to recognize that effective elastic thickness does not correspond to any real layering in the earth it's a proxy for that integrated composite strength depth curve but nevertheless it's a useful parameter to use for basin modeling but let's get back to strength depth curves so in this particular example we've got a strong lower crust because it's felspatic we can compare it with an alternative over here which has a single composition for the entire crust and no strong felspathic lower crust or layer and, and, and so the possibility is that we can explain the variations in seismicity in terms of composition so perhaps the lower crust of the Zagros is not a felspathic rheology whereas in Africa it is but of course an alternative is to suggest that the heat flow in each of these two places is different so that maybe Africa is more like this model here so that we have a stronger lower crust because the geotherm is less in Africa than it is in the Zagros area let's add another strength depth profile using a felspathic lower crust but with a higher heat flow in which case we've reduced the strength of the upper mantle and all the strength here is now contained in the crust so by varying composition and temperature we can generate a range of strength depth profiles for many geodynamic modelers a critical feature is whether the lower crust is strong or weak and this has led to some shorthand in describing these behaviors a weak lower crust or model is described as a jelly sandwich the soft jelly sandwiched between a stronger upper crust and a strong upper mantle we can contrast that with a behavior known as creme brulee where all the strength is in the upper part of the profile and we have a weak lower profile which can creep very easily let's get down from the sugar kick and think about the earthquakes again and it's no wonder these earthquake distributions with depth are so variable if we can change in the continents the composition with depth and the geothermal gradient so perhaps we should not be surprised by the complexity of continental deformation given the range of possible compositions of continental crust and the range of temperature structure within it as well but what about the oceans there's very little deformation within oceanic lithosphere away from the plate boundaries let's go back to strength depth profiles and compare oceanic lithosphere with continental so there's our continental strength depth profile and here on the left is a compositional model for the oceanic lithosphere with a thin crust overlying mantle well consider a depth between 10 and 20 kilometers in our continental model this is occupied by a quartz rheology which is able to creep and is therefore weak similarly at a depth of about 30 35 kilometers just above the moho the continental case shows a creeping felspar domain so there are two areas in the crust of the continents that go down to a depth of 30 35 kilometers that are weak well if we consider the same depth 
in the oceanic lithosphere? Well, once we get below about 8 kilometers, we're dealing with an olivine dominated rheology. An olivine, at those sorts of depths, is going to behave in a very strong manner. So then you can use that information to build a strength depth profile. The key thing is that the frictional domain continues to a very great depth before it gets outcompeted by the creeping olivine dominated rheologies. Consequently, the brittle ductile transition in the oceans is very deep, but also more critically from the strength, look at the integrated curve, the grey parts of these diagrams. The oceans are just so much stronger than their continental counterparts. And actually, we've taken quite a strong rheological model for the continents. If we have a thick crust dominated by quartz in the continents, the lower crust will be very weak indeed by the time we get down towards the Moho. So the upshot is that ocean lithosphere is stronger than continental. So now we can begin to understand the distribution and the complexity of the distribution of earthquakes across the planet. Lots of earthquakes in the continents, betraying a complexity of deformation. Simplicity in the oceans, because strain localizes onto the plate boundaries, leaving strong plate interiors when they are oceanic lithosphere. The rheology of the lithosphere is depending on the composition and the temperature. These plates have got a rheological structure that's layered. The outer part is dominated by frictional processes, and as such, it's pressure sensitive and becomes stronger with depth. But as we go down and temperatures increase, these frictional processes could be outcompeted by creep processes so that the brittle upper layers are underlain by ductile lower layers. Temperature is key, so too is composition and the distribution of those compositions. Because oceanic crust is so thin, the behaviour of oceanic lithosphere is dominated by the mantle. And so it behaves in a simple and strong manner. Continents have a variable composition with depth. They're more complicated and the material involved is weaker than mantle rocks. And therefore it's prone to more deformation, a more complicated deformation, than the oceanic lithosphere.